Thank you, ladies. That was beautiful. Good morning. How fun is this? I get to be up here in Perry's absence. How is everybody? Cold, very cold. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here this morning. Uh, Perry is actually gone for a couple of weeks, and in her absence, she invited me to share with all of you. And uh, when I inquired about what it was that she wanted me to share, she said, share about what God's doing in the life of your family. Uh, that was pretty general. I wasn't sure what she was, where she was going with that. So I prayed about it, and um, God led me directly to the content that I'm going to share today. Um, and he made it abundantly clear that it has a direct tie to women's Bible study. So this is going to be a really fun morning. So this has also become one of my most favorite stories to tell. So I hope you enjoy it. So it all started uh, back in early 2021. A young woman came to the church. Uh, she was in distress, and she asked to speak to a woman on staff. Jenny Ivester was the woman that she connected with. Uh, they prayed together, had a conversation, and uh, Jenny gave her a Bible study and sent her on her way. So Jenny then came and found Perry and I and said, hey, would you ladies be willing to, to connect with her to make sure she gets plugged into women's Bible study? So we, re we both reached out, didn't connect, but the, the weekend before Bible study was to start, and I believe it was the book of Philippians, uh, this young lady's registration rolled in, so I knew to expect her, and we were keeping an eye out for her. Well, in that season, we also had a brand new church database, and an email slipped out, un unbeknownst to me, saying that Bible study started at 8 o'clock on Monday morning. So this young lady shows up to the school office, because the church office is not open at 8 o'clock in the morning. She shows up to the school office uh, for Bible study, never, never having gone to a Bible study before. So the school principal calls over. I'm actually at my desk, and she says, there's a woman here for women's Bible study. And I said, well, there is no women's Bible study. It's Monday. And so I hear her relaying this message to this woman, and she sends her on her way. So then I'm, I'm pondering that, thinking, huh, <gasps> oh, no, it's probably her. <laughs> I'm supposed to be tracking with her. So I call the school principal back, and I said, can you catch her? Is it too late? And she runs over to my office, and she says, well, there she goes. She's leaving the parking lot. She's gone. So I'm thinking, man, we just have had an epic fail on trying to connect this woman to women's Bible study. We, did, we have not made a first good impression at all. So lo and behold, uh, the young lady travels home and then turns around and comes back. So um, at this point, I'd like to introduce you to my friend Chandra. She's going to come up here and tell this story with me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Chandra tell you a little bit about her family. But before we get into that, I, I do want to just um, ask Chandra the, pre the, the question, Chandra, you went home and then returned. What made you come back? Blue one. Okay. I, you guys can hear me. We can, right? Is it working? Okay. I didn't hear myself, sorry. Hello? Bring okay. It, bring it on over. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, as you guys can see, I'm really good at uh, <laughs> feeling kind of silly in front of people at this point. So that's kind of why I, I had come back um, was because I had already shown up unannounced, um, had met with Jenny, and um, was really looking forward to this Bible study. And, you know, I felt like I just wasn't quite, like, getting it, and I didn't want to be late again, you know, so I, I just... I felt like I had to be persistent um, because I just wasn't, it wasn't clear. There was something pulling me that says, like, you don't have all the information yet. Like, don't be a blonde again. <laughs> like, <laughs> go back and get some clarifying information so you don't have to embarrass yourself again. So, <laughs> so uh, Chandra returns with the school principal, and we go in for introductions. And, of course, we're both in masks at this point. We pull our masks down, and we quickly realize we know each other. So Chandra actually grew up with my older daughter, Emma. This is Emma and Chandra. Emma's at the top, Chandra's at the bottom. 
<laughs> so they've known each other for a while. Um, they traveled all the way from grade school through high school level. Um, so, okay, so from there, um, they, they had gone through school together and um, some life decisions and belief systems and all, all of that just kind of put a wedge of separation between the two girls. So Chandra, let's go back. Um, before we launch into that story, let's go back. Um, tell us a little bit about your family and what was going on in your life leading up to coming to the church office in distress. Yeah. So this is my husband, uh, Kyle, and our almost three-year-old son, Wesley. And at the time I came to the office, I was a very new Christian. Um, and just coming to Christ was just a very tumultuous, really kind of a scary journey, to be honest. Um, it actually started here in women's Bible study. Um, so my husband and I are both firefighters, and I happen to work with, um, with Julie McAllister, who, um, who used to attend here. And she was vulnerable enough to have a conversation with me about Christ. Um, and I was someone who, you know, at best thought God was a bully and that Christ was a lie. Um, so she had that conversation with me. And she listened to my story, and she was just really patient. And she said, you know, Chandra, I'm sorry that, you know, you've been hurt. Um, and I'm sorry all these things have happened, but that's not who Jesus is. And she proceeded to tell me about how Jesus worked in her life and gave her the strength to do the many great things that she does. Um, so a little bit of time goes on. I don't think anything of it. I have my first child and in the throes of, um, you know, postpartum depression and anxiety. I get to the point where, like, I'm done. <laughs> I... Uh, I was just done, and I felt like my family deserved better, and I knew I just, the best thing for me to do would just be to, um, uh, would just be to leave, you know, and I was looking at my son, you know, you know, you have that, that, you know, they've been crying for like three straight months, and there's that rock of just like, please just stop crying, you know, and I'm doing that rock, and I'm thinking, man, Wesley, if you just knew how much I loved you, you wouldn't cry so much, you know, if, if you just knew how much I loved you. And at that moment, I knew in my heart that, like, that is a drop in the water for how much that Christ loves me. And um, it was just one of those things where I was like, oh, I've gone crazy. Perfect. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. On top of it all, um, you know, I've been, you know, a long-standing atheist. And, um, you know, and, and I was saved. And what do, you, what do you do with that kind of information? Well, you hide it for a little while is what you do. <laughs> That's what I did. Um, so, so that's the space I was in. I knew I was saved. Um, I knew that Christ was alive and well in my life, and I knew that um, there was a plan for me. Um, so I'm going through this information. My husband, I'm hiding a lot from my husband because, frankly, I think I'm going crazy, and I think he did too. Um, but, I, but I wanted to, but I was reading my Bible, and I was like, okay, I, I have a friend. I have a friend in this Bible and in, in, in this man, Jesus, you know. So I'm, I'm learning, but it was hard to put all these things I was learning into action. And I came to the church because my husband and I had just had a, a fight that literally didn't mean anything. But I was like, why do I, am I still behaving like someone who's not saved? Why am I still behaving these old patterns, right? Um, so I was like, I need, I need women in my life. I need women of God who are willing to share with me because I need, I need some help. <laughs> so... I quickly assessed in talking with Chandra, we, we spent some time talking and catching up and praying together, and I quickly assessed that she was really having a hard time navigating as a new believer. So, um, you know, I gave her some resources, we had a plan for her to start up with Bible study, and then at the end of this conversation, she asks to confess something to me. Chandra, what did you have to share? Yeah. Um, well, I confess that I was embarrassed to see Debbie, um, because she had known me as um, a non-believer, and in this new journey with Christ, looking back on a lot of the things that I said and did and felt were frankly really embarrassing, and probably the most, um, you know, the the most intimidating people I could think of were were other Christians, you know. So here I am, I've kind of been hiding in the back rows at church, and then which was kind of nice because I could be anonymous, right? And then I come in and meet someone who knows me and, like, who knows my history. And that was, like, very intimidating. I was like, <laughs> 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 um, but, but I had known Debbie to be someone who had this relationship with her daughter. 
um, that I knew that they were Christians and I knew that um, that Debbie loved Emma in a way that I so desperately wanted to be loved and um, seeing that as a young person without the confidence um, to 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 lean into that relationship I leaned out so that's what I confessed to her was like man <laughs> I wish I had what you have with your daughter she also talked about just the brokenness that existed between her and Emma and their relationship. And wouldn't you know it, in God's absolute perfect timing, my daughter, uh, she is a, is a resident at UC Davis, um, and she was home. She was home for a visit. And I said, I said to Chandra, how about you confess to Emma? And so I got on the phone and... Uh, asked Chandra for permission, asked Emma for permission, and uh, they met the next day. So Chandra, can you tell me um, what transpired in that conversation with Emma and in the days that followed? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, thankfully, um, Debbie had laid this foundation um, where Emma came to my house, and in our minds, we still looked the same, but we were completely different people. And we, we met with the basis of, like, how do we get closer to Christ? And when you have that, that like, framework, it was very easy to just, like, go head first into this relationship with, with Emma and then her with I of just friendship and just wanting to, like, just wanting to talk about Christ and wanting to talk about, you know, how do we, how do we treat other people? How do we, how do we represent um, ourselves to the world, you know? And it was just very easy to have this, like, you know, this relationship that you can only have when your foundation is, is you know, is of Christ and not your own. So Chandra got involved in Bible study. She was also, I think, simultaneously doing Bible study with Emma. Yeah. Um, they were doing some discipleship together. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a couple things I want to stop and just make note of at this point in the story. Uh, in addition to Chandra being plugged in in women's Bible study, God cared so intimately for Chandra that he continued to direct her to Bible study leaders for prayer and discipleship. And he used these leaders and mentors who were from firefighting families. Chandra's whole background, her and her husband, their whole background, so that he would just truly, you know, make himself known. And, um, and then the other thing that I told Chandra along the way, um, the Bible study prayer team has been praying for Emma. They prayed her all the way through medical school from start to finish. And um, one of the things that's been a prayer request uh, in Emma's life is she got down to Sacramento to start her residency and she didn't know a single Christian. And so I was just praying that God would bring a Christian woman into her life. And me and my little humanness thought that it would be by proximity, but mm -hmm. Chandra was that answer to prayer. Okay, so a couple months pass, and Chandra and Emma were growing together, and Chandra was growing here at Bible study, and then a big decision came in the spring. Yeah. What transpired and led up to that decision? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is a good time, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so I had, like, kind of passively mentioned to, to, to Emma that one of my big goals was, to, um, was I wanted to be baptized. And maybe that sounds simple to you all, but it was like a very, um, it was like a, it's like, can I do that <laughs> kind of thing? And she had mentioned it to Debbie. And before I knew it, I was signed up to, um, you know, to be baptized here at Good Shepherd, which I just couldn't imagine doing it anywhere else. So, And she, the little stinker, did not tell me she was going to be here for this. <laughs> um, but it was very advantageous because there was someone she needed to meet also. <laughs> so do you want to? Let's go to the next slide. So this is Keegan Cross and Jay Cross, and they are the son and husband of one of our Bible study ladies, Leslie Cross. She's over here if she wouldn't mind standing up. <laughs> so um, actually, the story just is so interesting. It's such a long tapestry that started many, many years ago. But our family actually met the Cross family at a small church when our kids were just toddlers. And so we have, um, we've known this family for a long time. So um, tell us, Chandra, what your connection is to the Cross family. Yeah. Um, so Jay is my, or was my medical director at Cresham. Um, and... I mean, you just can't not love the Cross family. <laughs> no. 
yeah, it's, you know, started professionally, but then, you know, Leslie is just the easiest person in the world to, uh, to love, so. So Leslie and I, um, gosh, it was many years ago, uh, she was attending Bible study. He, she's actually in an off-campus group on Wednesday mornings, but she was here on campus years ago. And both of our kids were actually at OHSU, both in the medical field. And Leslie and I were plotting and scheming to, <laughs> to connect them. We thought they might be a good fit. Uh, and we got permission to get them together, but the timing was just not right. So, okay, so Chandra, back to you. There is a celebration that takes place in your home after the baptism, and something significant took place there. Can you tell us what? Yes, yeah. So for weeks now, um, Em and I had been plotting for her to meet Keegan, um, and that kind of came about just because um, Jay came into my fire station, and I just, as soon as I saw him, I was just like, Keegan, like, he loves God, and he loves his mother, like, what more could I want for my friend, you know, like, right, like, when you have daughters, right, what do you, what do you tell her to look for in a man, like, Jesus and love his mama, gonna treat you well, right, so those were the things that I wanted for my, you know, my best friend, um, that's what I wanted for Emma, um, and so we had been plotting, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you get these two to meet casually, because frankly, it's like a really intense, like, situation to be like, hey, found them <laughs> um but yeah like you said I mean you they they already knew each other and it was just such a funny such a funny way to come about so I remember Emma coming home and telling me this story I think it went down and correct me if I'm wrong but I think they were t they were gathered together after the baptism and I think Chandra so delicately said maybe you two should grab coffee like now <laughs> <laughs> yeah well yeah and to you know to Leslie's credit um you know, after the baptism, she was just so kind to, um, I didn't have anything planned after, I, you know, and she was so kind just to make me feel um, like a part of her family and celebrate that, and um, so everyone came over to my house, and it was just a really, um, it was a really just beautiful God way to let these two young people meet and, and feel that, feel that spark. So Chandra, what can you tell us about their relationship? What can you say about them? Oh man, I mean, you just can't have more two beautiful people inside um, who are such public servants um, that really, that, that need each other, I think, you know, in a way. Um, gosh, what did I write? It's just like, how much can you? Um, yeah, there's, honestly, there's, there's just so much to say. Um, but but Emma and Keegan just individually are amazing people, and I think we all know that when you when you get married, like, you know, there's there's a range of emotions throughout uh, the lifetime of a marriage, and I can't imagine in, um, any two people uh, going for it like these two could. So one of the things I witnessed is, as you know, Chandra and Emma got to be super connected, and as Keegan entered the picture. Naturally, Keegan and Emma spent more time together, which meant less time for Emma and Chandra. And so um, they, even though they'd grown really close, they were really starting to, to pull apart. But I feel like God really taught you something in this season of separation. Can you speak to mm -hmm. that? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think, um, I think in those times of desperation, God gave me what, what I needed and what Emma needed, which was that fellowship. Um, but it was like a life raft, you know. It's not something that you're meant to hang on to forever, you know, with, you know, a death grip for dear life. <laughs> um, so I think, I think as, as Emma's and I's um, confidence in ourselves grew, we were able to take that and put our energy into the things that mattered most, you know, which was our families and our growing families. Um, so it was a, I think it's a, it's a natural, it's, it's the way it's supposed to be, you know. So Chandra, this has been just a huge season of spiritual growth for you. How would you summarize what God is doing in your life right now? I thought about it, and I'd like to just read um, a piece of um, scripture that uh, really got me through that time before we had met, um, and it's Second Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. I'll just paraphrase, but um, three times I plead with the Lord about this, that it should leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I spent my whole life trying to 
trying to be tough and trying to have it figured out and um, and be self sufficient. And what I've found is that um, I'm saved when when you let that go and you give that to God. Um, I think I can say it better than Paul could. So. <laughs> So this has uh, been a season of growth for Chandra, and this has been an incredible season of celebration for us. As you can see, this is what we got for our holiday gift. Um, this, this story that we're sharing with you today is really God's love story for all of us. It's a story about wandering. It's a story about pursuit. It's a story of forgiveness, of restoration, of fulfillment and overwhelming abundance. So I just want to encourage you, ladies, for those of you who are feeling off course right now, who are growing weary from the weight, who are longing for the fulfillment of your cries from God, we really encourage you today to sit in the hope of the journey. We encourage you to be alert to God's movement and to be thinking about your own God story in this season. So ladies, can you um, just give, give a round of applause to Chandra for just being vulnerable and authentic this morning? Thank you. Thanks for allowing us to tell that story, ladies. God is so good, isn't he? So, uh, ladies, I'm going to do a quick run-through of announcements. We do still have a full morning, and we're going to hear from Krista this morning. Um, we're going to revisit uh, some of the announcements from last week. We've got a widow's ministry starting up with uh, Paula Epp, who is our leader. Where are you, Paula? Paula's over there. And we've got Nancy Madison and Suzanne Morgan co-leading with her. They are going to meet the second and fourth Thursday of the month at Paula's house, and she lives near Hilliard and Highway 26. There are informational, beautiful informational cards that Paula made up on the back table, and if you're at all interested, uh, there's a sign up in the back. All right, ladies, we also have a women's worship night. Who is excited about this? So this is taking place Thursday, March 24th at 7, and we will have our very own beloved worship team. We're also going to be doing um, prayer and uh, table discussion, and we are asking you to kindly complete a really super easy registration, and um, there is a sign in the back on the back table with a QR code that will link you directly to registration. And then last but not least, Perry asked me to... Um, to talk about silencing your cell phones. Apparently that's been a bit of a problem in here. So I'm gonna take this opportunity to give you a moment to just check your phones. <laughs> All right, ladies, well, it's been a spirit-filled morning, and I am confident that Krista is going to deliver an incredible message for us this morning. She's going to be covering Acts 17, 18 through 23. So help me in joining uh, Krista and welcoming her to the stage. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, yep, had it wrong the whole time. Perfect. Oh, thank you. I'm really sorry about my singing voice, you guys, up there. Awesome. Because uh, I go all over the place, so, uh, in not a good way. <laughs> um, I really don't know why I'm up here after that. That was so good, wasn't it? I'm, and then I'm a hot mess because I'm over there blubbering and... <sighs> But it kind of goes with uh, what I've been thinking about lately and what God has been pressing upon me as I've been doing Acts. Do you guys find yourself, as you're, listening, as you're reading Paul and he is sharing the gospel and Peter before him was sharing the gospel, 
And there's all these different responses. Are you thinking about people in your own life and the responses they've had to the gospel, whether it was for or against? Um, that's what has been on my mind. So with my family, it's just my parents and I who are the believers, and then everyone else has chosen no or not yet. Um, wow, and this has not been emotional this whole time. I blame this on Debbie. <laughs> so um, a few weeks ago, because I was late starting to prep for this, so it was only a few weeks ago, I was prepping, and then I had my whole family over for dinner. It was my mom's birthday. We were going to celebrate. So a few people had arrived, sitting at the table, waiting for the rest of, rest of them, especially the guest of honor, not my mom, the five-month-old baby. That's the guest of honor, him, and he comes with his parents. Um, and we're waiting for them. And I'm still prepping dinner because I'm running behind because that's what I do. And... Um, the other people at the table, not believers, and one of them says, hey, what are you doing this weekend? And you know those moments where you just, you and God have a quick little moment? And you're like, okay, God, direct my words here and make them open to whatever comes out. And I said, well, I'm prepping for a talk. And they know that I'm involved in women's ministries. And um, so I thought that was going to be the end of it. Because in the past, if I bring up anything, it gets closed pretty quickly. But not this time. It's actually the one who's adamantly, who says, my brother says, I don't have a problem with God. I can even get behind Jesus, that he is God, but I'm not going to have anyone else be the Lord of my life. Part of me kind of appreciates that. He knows exactly where his sticking point is, right? So then I can speak directly to that. Uh, the other person just doesn't respond, doesn't like conflict, so they do not respond. That's still a no, or a not yet. So my brother goes, oh, what are you speaking on? So, well, <laughs> um, and this is all within two minutes. And so how do you explain the book of Acts to people who have never read the book of Acts, know the gospel message, have heard it, but don't know the book of Acts? So I'm trying to explain that this is the outgoing of the people who have seen Jesus, heard from him, seeing him rise from the dead and, and ascend to heaven. And it's the spreading of the good message that everyone will give an answer to. And I said, and basically what I saw in this passage so far is that there's three responses. There's a yes, and not just a yes, but a pushing forward, right? Studying and searching for themselves. And then there's an adamant no. And then there's the one that just doesn't really give a response. And that also is a no. And I said, but what is interesting to me is that the message doesn't change. The message is the same because God is the same. His gift is the same. It's up to the person to decide what they want. And every person is going to answer that question one day, right? So, and they still ask more questions. So... And I'm just trying to drop tidbits because I know, I know how they think and how they respond. And so um, we talked for just a few more minutes, and then the baby showed up. And that's all that mattered at that point, this baby. So, but I just so appreciate that the Lord allowed just a brief two-minute conversation in a way that if I had brought it up, it would have been instant shutdown. But because they brought it up, I was able to speak into that, right? I'm praying that for all of us today, that we would seek out those opportunities and that we would step into them also. I also love how he put on display for me, God did, at my kitchen table were three people sitting there who represented the three different groups of people we see, right? So it made it all the more alive and made me eager to dig in all the more. So why don't we just stop and pray because I'm shaking like a leaf, so... We just, uh, we come to you, Lord, knowing that you are the author and perfecter of our faith, knowing that you and only you redeem and give life and make new. We pray this, Lord, for the people in our lives that we know now and those that are yet to come. 
that you would be preparing their hearts, that you would be preparing us in our words and our steps and the opportunities that we have to share with them and that we would boldly speak to them, not to correct them, but to step into their life right where they are, not where we think they should be, but where they are. All of this, Lord, we want to hear glory. Amen. So uh, there's been an interesting image that has come to mind over the last week or so. It's the image of feet. And uh, my closest friends will tell you that it's so not an image for you, Krista. Because I don't just have a dislike of feet. I have a, an aversion to them. Like, they are meant to be clothed at all times. <laughs> and, um, yeah, my friends think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, you do too. Um, to the point where I get, you know, cookie cutters with feet. I had one time I had a surprise birthday party that was all feet. Yeah, <laughs> hilarious. Um, if I am sitting on the couch, and my friends actually are pretty kind to me and try not to do this, but you know how you'll sit on a couch and you put your feet up to the side? Oh my gosh, that is like my worst nightmare. <laughs> and I try to quietly just move a little bit, you know, that whole social distancing. And I'm taking shallow breaths as I'm trying to get myself back under control. And yet God in his great humor thinks it's funny. Let's use feet in Krista's life this week. Let's just continue to remind her of feet. <sighs> I tried to even have a... Um, a PowerPoint that had feet on it, and I truly, I looked for like eight seconds, and I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> Not even, I, baby feet, like 18 months and younger, nothing beyond that. Um, but God kept pressing it upon me, and he kept saying, happy are the feet. That's, the, that's what kept coming across to me, happy are the feet. And no matter how much time has passed, he continues to do this. So, and it comes from Isaiah 52. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, Israel, your God reigns. Happy are the feet. Our passage today begins with Paul and Silas traveling, passing through a few towns, and ultimately stopping in Thessalonica because there was a synagogue there. So Paul begins reasoning with the Jews. I thought this was an interesting word. Did you guys pick up how often it was used in our passage? I think five times. Four times the word was reason. Another time it was, um, I think it was discuss or discourse, one of the two. It was used in there. And I looked it up, and uh, because it hasn't been used before this in Acts, so there's a uh, there's been a, sh a change, a shift. And the reason the word reason in here means to mingle thought with other thought, to converse, to discuss. It's more than teaching. It's a sit down conversation between you and another person. They're asking questions. You're asking questions, and you're coming to a consensus based on the information you both bring. This is what Paul is doing in the synagogue. Um, I'm sure there were a lot of questions. Because <laughs> Paul is teaching about the suffering of Christ. Not a light topic. And I'm sure as he continued to talk, um, th there were discussions about it. And we see that there were some Jews and many devout Greeks who came to know Jesus, who were persuaded by this reasoning. And really, we also see, and it's no wonder, that there's many Jews who are not happy at all. And they make quite the stir. And they bring other people into it, right? And they pull others in and they create a mob. And what's fascinating to me is not that, yes, that there's a mob, but it's what Luke chooses to focus on in this mob. Because as we know, an unplanned, unruly mob isn't going to have one thought, right? But Luke chooses to tell us only two things of what they say. And one of them is, these men have turned the world upside down and have come here too. And the other one 
is they are all acting contrary to Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, this Jesus. Turning the world upside down. I mean, we're talking about Thessalonica. We're not talking about Rome itself. Yes, it's a big city, but it's not the city. So is it accurate what the men are saying in that moment? Not to the council. In general, is it accurate? Most definitely. Definitely. Paul turns upside down what is believed about Jesus as God, first to the Jews, and then we see later to the Gentiles. First, Paul points out to the Jews and Jesus, I'm sorry, that Jesus was a suffering Messiah, one that had to die and rise again, a fulfillment of the scriptures. And I was doing some studying on uh, scriptures that showed this prophecy, and a lot of it came back to Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. So we're going to look at a few of these prophecies. So the prophecy in Psalm 22, the first one is, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? And the fulfillment was Jesus on the cross in Matthew 27. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Back in, again in, 20, in Psalm 22, we see that everyone sees me, mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads saying, is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Again, the fulfillment and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it, in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down off the cross. The next prophecy, they divided my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. In John, we see after the crucifixion, the soldiers had crucified Jesus. They took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who it shall be, whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. I'm just choosing a few. If you go to Psalm 22, you're going to find a whole lot more. <laughs> Isaiah 53, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. The fulfillment is John when he says it's finished. It is finished. His life brought us peace. And then Jesus prophesies about himself in Matthew. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day, Matthew says. And then Paul, writing to the Romans, and he, has shown, he was shown to be the son of God when he raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Who announces peace and brings good news of happiness. Who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Jesus is the messenger. He's also the proclaimer of his own peace that he created for us and his salvation for us. And he says it all when he says, your God, me, I reign. But in time, in the time of Paul, and even today, this isn't the type of leader we want, right? A suffering leader, king. It's not the picture the Jews had for their savior, their long-awaited forever king. They saw the kingdom of Rome as their greatest threat. Jesus came to save them from a much more deadly kingdom one of darkness and futility and death, 
but most couldn't even see it and continued in their dark thinking. They couldn't see that their world was actually already upside down. And he was turning it right side up. The same is true today. Those who do not follow Jesus, who do not see that they serve this same kingdom, one that seeks to destroy them and ultimately will, they continue on this path instead of turning back. Later in chapter 17, Paul explains Jesus to the Gentiles at Athens. That was an interesting section, didn't you think? What I loved is that Paul, about Paul is that it's a good reminder to me as I speak to people that Paul doesn't use the same methodology to speak to both groups. One, he uses scripture. He goes back to something that the Jews know, right? They're going to know their scripture. He reasons with them in the, in the synagogue. But he understands that the average Athenian isn't going to know any scripture. And it doesn't hold any, val it's not valid to them for any purpose. So he doesn't throw up his hands when he looks at the city and all of its idols. At least not in this chapter, right? He instead, in verse 16, the word is provoked. Which when I see the word provoked, I'm thinking anger, right? Take charge. But that's not what we see Paul do. His spirit was provoked. In the Christian Standard Bible version, it says, deeply distressed. And I saw that repeated over and over again in different translations. Many, many, many years ago, uh, my mom and I had an opportunity to go to Italy. Um, we stopped in Rome uh, first because I was excited to share my love of history and art and pasta, right? We loved visiting the fountains, eating gelato daily, touring the Colosseum, but the crown jewel of Rome, the city within the city, I saved that for the last. Because remember, I love art, so I'm super excited and expecting we're going to spend all day there. We, get, we, we walk inside, and she's happy to be there because, by the way, it's August, and it's 103 degrees outside, and it's humid, so she's just happy to be inside anywhere that's cool. And because it's art, they have to keep it regulated, and so it's nice and cool inside. And at first, she's having a good time, and we're starting to go through the sections, and up ahead, we see this long line, and people are just kind of barely shuffling along, but they're all waiting patiently. And I had, been, I had been there a couple years earlier, and so I knew what was going on. And so I told my mom, what this line is waiting for is there's a statue at the end. It's a, a seated man. And they're all waiting for their turn to be able to walk up. And now you can only touch the foot. But it used to be you could either kiss the foot or touch it. And um, some, for many, it's a tourist thing. But for the devout, it's a sign of adoration. And it's a sign of requesting of blessing. And um, so I told her about that. We bypassed that line. Went on to look at more art. And we went our separate ways because we look at art very differently. Um, and a little later, I found her sitting by herself on a bench facing another statue. And as I got closer, I realized she's crying walk up and ask her what the problem is and, um, you know, thinking maybe she's overcome by the art. No. Um, <laughs> she's, she tells me um, what started out as a really pretty cry, which I did not inherit, turned into an ugly cry, which I did inherit. And she tells me that she is just broken by what she sees for the building and for the art and the cost it was to the people centuries ago who paid for it, thinking they were paying off some of the debt of sin. And that really got to her. And she saw it all as tainted. And then she also was crying and praying over the line of people, which she could see out of her periphery, the line of people, because she goes, because they're lost. So she was praying for their salvation. I had 
two thoughts. One I'm not proud of now, but it's accurate to what happened. And the other one took years to develop. The first thought is, wish I'd brought my dad. This would not happen. <laughs> it's true. He would have just seen the art, moved on. I wish I had been quicker back then to see what she could see. So it took a few years for me to appreciate her perception of what was going on. Going on. But once I finally understood, it helped me to view people and events more accurately from then on. There are many times I have to ask myself, in the last two years has given us plenty of opportunity. Why am I upset? Am I upset by the activity that I see by those who don't know Jesus yet? Or am I upset because I am broken for the person who is lost? Do I see them as a lost person or do I see them as a lost cause? I look at our city and I've had to really think about that. Have I thrown up my hands? Or do I see, like when um, God was talking to Paul about, there are many people here in this city who know me, promising him, don't be afraid, go, speak. So do I see the lost as Jesus sees them? That was my question. Do I act? Am I praying for them? Like my mom was praying for those that she saw before her. Am I acting? Am I stepping into the fray? making conversation with those around me? Am I taking the opportunity to make those places available? Because it's pretty easy to be in our little circles, right? And not really step out. So am I making opportunities to meet people and to have conversations and to get to know them for them because I desire the best for them, not because I want to change them? Or do I respond with judgment and anger and throw up my hands? Do I lean into the fray, or do I remain removed and safely on the sidelines? How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Paul is the messenger of the good news, the salvation. His spirit is provoked, and he leans into the fray. First speaking in the synagogue and then going out into the square. He spoke in a language of his audience. And I don't mean Greek. Verse 18 says he conversed and debated with them. This was their language, right? Of philosophers and Stoics. He met them where they were. Didn't expect them to come where he was. He spoke in a manner that spoke to them. When taken to... Oropagus, to a larger gathering, he spoke to what they knew, and that was the worship of their gods. He spoke of an upside-down world when he told them of the one unknown God, the one who actually can be known. This God was so different from anything they knew. He is creator, and yet he's far above his creation. He is self-sufficient, and he cannot be contained by man-made places. He holds all men and all things. He is the giver of life and the sustainer of life. Then he went on to say, not only is he the creator, but he is the resurrected judge who will one day no longer be patient and has set a day for judging. So repent. For the Greeks, this is an upside down view of who God is. In his commentary, Enduring Word, David Guzik explains what is happening. Paul recognized that these philosophers had to change their ideas of God. They had to move from their own personal opinions to an understanding of who God is according to what he tells us about himself in the Bible, not anywhere else. Does Paul see many people responding positively to the call of repentance that day? 
It says some. This isn't like one of those, one of those passages, right, where at the end the sentence is, and they multiplied, and they multiplied. This isn't one of those. But that does not mean it's a failure. The delivery may change based on the audience, but the message is the same. The results are up to God. There are many ideas of who God is, both by Christians and those who have not met Jesus yet. The only accurate idea of him is what he has told, his, told us about himself, nothing else. So I looked up some of the I am statements that Jesus makes about himself in John. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. In this moment, he's claiming deity, this, that he is God. Just like when God spoke to Moses in Exodus 2 from the burning bush, tasking him with delivering Israel from bondage from, of Egypt, Moses asked, well, what do I say? Who do I tell Israel sent me? And God replied, you tell them, I am has sent me to you. It's the th same thing. I am. The next one, Jesus is speaking to Martha after Lazarus has died. And they're talking about, Martha has just said, yes, Lord, one day we will see him at the resurrection, meaning the resurrection of all. And he tells her in John 11, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. He is the resurrection. Not he is the way to resurrection. He is the resurrection. And the last one I'm going to show, there's, I think I'm only showing like half of them, but the last one I'm going to show is John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, his disciple, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This one seems to be a sticking point. Sometimes even within Christian circles. I've had too many conversations lately with people who are like, there's got to be more to it. Jesus has to make it wider than that. No, he makes it very clear. Very clear. He is God. He is resurrection. He is life. He is truth. He is. The declarations Jesus makes about himself are contrary to our natural state without him. In Genesis 3, original sin is depicted as mankind deciding for themselves what is good instead of what God has already told them what is good and trusting that he's right. They decide they're going to be their own God. So the upside, this upside-down world is made right again by the suffering king. His life, his death, his resurrection bring life and resurrection to all who believe. And one day will give new life to this earth. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of them who bring good news. Announces peace and brings good news of happiness. Who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. What I love about that, and I'm encouraged by that, is that the happiness lies in who the message is about. It doesn't, doesn't rely on the condition of the messenger or the feet, right? Thank goodness, because mine are a hot mess. But it doesn't matter on that. It's all about Jesus and who he is. Luke shows us that in Acts 18.9. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. I read that and I thought, do I see Portland that way? Do I see it white and ready for harvest? I started praying that way. God is the one at work, and he has prepared the people for the message of his kingdom. When I was looking up the reference on happy or the feet, I found that Isaiah wasn't the only place this is mentioned. Actually, Paul quotes it himself in Romans. 
How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not ever heard, never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. God's people, you and I, we are the messengers of the good news, of salvation, of announcing peace. How happy are the feet. So that's my challenge, is that we go out and live upside down lives. Instead of thinking this world has a, it's a little off center, but it's the right one. Live a life that loves sacrificially. And sometimes I think some of these are even difficult to remember within our Christian faith. To love sacrificially, to care for the outcast, to bind the wounds of our enemies, to lean into the fray. You are the messenger. Your feet and your mouth were meant for action. Loving action.